series of streams where I will be starting as an alpha clone capsule viewer completely from scratch. I have about 10 years of background in even line. I have been playing for actively playing for about two to three years, depending on what you count for active gameplay. And I have been watching the development of the universe and the drama that's going on for most of this 10 year period. I would like to dedicate this stream to those people who would like to start playing EVE Online in 2021 or in the next few years before the game changes again completely. And I will try not to use as much as possible uh, significant background knowledge. Instead, I will show and explain what I am doing, why I am doing, uh, based of course on my experience, but not in such a way that people will see and not understand what I'm doing. So, without further ado, let's begin. The first choice is probably one of the hardest when you create a new character or new capsuleer, is the choice of Empire. If Online, as you probably know by now, is populated by four NPC empires, uh, Kaldari uh, State, Galente, Amar Empire and Minvatar. All four are pretty much equal and you cannot say that some empire is really overpowered or completely unbalanced and especially considering that further down the line when you train more skill points you will be able to freely change uh, what ships you fly. Uh, it, this choice does not really mean a lot in the long term. However, when you start as an alpha clone, especially when you start completely from scratch without any resources or support from other players, you probably want to have this kind of uh, choice made in a more meaningful way. And here are a bit of my thoughts what about each of the empires and why I would like to make the choice that I am about to make. So the first Empire Kaldari State uh, is mostly flying shield-based ships. If Online has two primary types of tanking, uh, shield tanking and armor tanking. There is also hull resource uh, that is available to your ships that indicates structural integrity of the ship itself. Uh, but uh, this one is rarely used as a way of sustaining your structure. Uh, so each of the Empire has preference for either shield or armor tanking. Uh, and then each of the Empire features own set of weapons. Those weapons are not unique, so there is uh, overlap to some extent. Uh, for example, Kaldari is a state and Empire that runs uh, mostly shield-based ships. What this means is that, in, in practice, when you get damage, it mostly regenerates itself. At least this is one of the properties of shields, that they are able to regenerate themselves passively. This is so-called passive tanking. And then uh, for armor, there is no such option. Also, when you have uh, your struc the structure of your ship, uh, first there is shield, and then there is armor, and then there is hull. And when you are doing tanking, when you have, sh when you use shield tanking, uh, you basically tank with the very first front line of your sources, and then you have armor and hull, whatever is available on your ship, as your reserve. And then when you are tanking with armor, or God forbid you are tanking with hull, uh, then you will be able to. Uh, you will have less of this reserve, so you will have less, uh, a bit more fragile ship. So shield tanking is good for that purpose. On the other hand, uh, shield tanked ships have a drawback is that uh, the game considers them a bit larger target, so they are easier to hit. And obviously also there are different resistances. I will talk about that a little bit later. Now, 
the primary difference between shield arm and armor tanking is basically that the shield has this capacity to self-regenerate and to um, be when it is exploited by a specific set of modules uh, there is a separate paradigm of design of ships that is not actually available to armor tank ships. Now, as a weapon system, Kaldari State uses rockets, and this uh, weapon system has primary advantage over uh, guns. Okay, there are three types of weapon systems, primarily guns, rockets, and drones. So, guns are effectively point-and-shoot type of thing. They deal the damage immediately, they have equations that are based on distance to the target, so your guns are seemingly deal less damage the further your target away, and the gun guns can miss your target based on whether this target is moving relatively to you. Drones are automatic systems. They f try to autonomously follow the target that they have been specified and they try to kill it. They also have their own guns, so they are not completely a separate system in that aspect. So they will fail to hit small targets if they are not able to uh, what's called in EVE track it. So they are not able to hit it and uh, be precise enough. At the same time, rockets are not uh, follow, following the same rules as guns. Uh, rockets have two main characteristics. One is distance, to what, to how far these rockets can fly. Uh, this is a product of rocket velocity and rocket flight time. Basically, the amount of fuel it has. And then the second targeting characteristic is a uh, product of rocket velocity, ex explosion velocity and uh, explosion size. So for the purpose of hitting a target, rocket does not really care in which direction that target is flying relatively to rocket or relatively to the ships that f have shot this rocket. And this gives rockets a an edge that the ship can try to be uh, agile and maneuverable and to av avoid enemy guns but for example when you will have at the same time guns on your own ship you will also fail to hit target with guns unless your guns are aimed to shoot at an agile target which are typically less damage dealing guns so in case of rockets you have a little bit different gameplay um, so, Kaldari is primarily shields and rockets. Galenta is uh, armor tanking empire, and their primary weapon are guns, namely blasters, and then they have secondary weapon in form of drones. Uh, to be specific, all empires at some step uh, get drones. So pretty much every other ship in the game has ability to fly some amount of drones. But ships that just fly drones is not necessarily dealing a lot of damage with them, because every ship has bonuses on the hull that gives that give some advantage to using one or another weapon system. And this is actually the primary reason why you would say that a Kaldari ship is a ship that is intended for shields, because it will have bonuses for shields. And Galente ship is intended for armor, because it will have bonuses for armor, as either in form of resistances or in form of uh, bonuses to repair rates, and so on. So, Galente, fire, laser, uh, fire blasters. Blasters is a so-called hybrid weapon system. Uh, guns are not created equal. Guns have uh, basically three br branches, and these branches go to between these three empires, Galente, Amar, and Minotaur. So Galente is a hybrid uh, between what and what. So Amar has guns, which are lasers. Lasers are pure energy-based weapon, so they have no projectile element and they are hitting target with electromagnetic and thermal radiation. This gives 
them uh, such properties that they can switch their ammo immediately, but this ammo has almost always the same damage type. Also, this switching allows them to pick optimal range, uh, optimal ammo to shoot the target at a specific range. Uh, I will talk about this later a little bit when we are going to design some ships. Uh, but the primary different, uh, the primary property is that lasers have a fixed uh, type of damage and they shoot straight <laughs> they have uh, immediate damage application they uh, have no projectile element this is like in terms of game design they have they adjust energy now contrary to that the other side of the spectrum is Minmatar. These guys use our conventional guns, so they are very <laughs> low-tech, I would say, so they use uh, projectile-based weapons, they use guns that shoot heavy bodies of uh, metal, they use autocannons, they use very huge guns, and those guns and the projectiles can sometimes have a little bit different composition. But, in principle, uh, Minmatar weapons system is based on projectiles. And for that, uh, the game treats this system as less accurate. So, in principle, Amar system is, has a little bit more tracking, and at the same time, Minmatar system in general has a bit, little bit less tracking, so it's a bit, difficult, a bit more difficult to hit a target that uh, moves across you. Now, Galente system uses blasters. Blasters are basically uh, railguns or a system, uh, a system of weaponry that uh, takes a projectile but doesn't accelerate it with well, powder or some explosive material. Instead, it uses electrical energy and accelerates, accelerates it through the acceleration chamber. And this is essentially a hybrid between lasers which use pure energy and projectile weaponry which uses pure projectiles as form of dealing damage. In that sense uh, Galente weapons uh, have average properties between these two. So uh, they have average tracking and they have very close range for blasters or one type of the weaponry and on the other hand they have very good range on the other type of the weapon is a long range one. They also have typically higher damage for the type of weapon and class of ship that uh, they are compatible with. At the same time, lasers have as the ability to switch quickly uh, between optimal ranges and this allows you to be a little bit more efficient in applying damage, especially in PvE encounters, where you have more control of the, over the battlefield. And then uh, in Minmatar case, the main feature of this is that those projectiles are really flexible, so you can have different damage types. This is another good property also for the rockets. The rockets can have different uh, warheads, which will means that they will have different damage types. And if you have played any RPGs, you would know that uh, elemental attacks, they usually have some kind of... Uh, ev every entity in games like that has some kind of weak spot uh, and so on. In case of EVE Online, all NPCs, or actually most of NPCs, have some kind of weak spot that allows you to use your weapon system more efficiently. Now, in terms of secondary weapon, Galente use drones and Amar use drones. But Galente are probably the, the empire that uses drone ships the most. So their hybrid weaponry and drone systems are almost equal. You will have pretty much the same amount of ships that have specialty in drones and the other specialty in hybrid system. At the same time, Amars primarily use lasers. Their use of drones is available on some ships, but these are mostly uh, lore-based um, hybrids with Galente technology or 
some kind of spin-offs, uh, a little bit uh, decadent uh, clans of Amar Empire that have this kind of technology and use drones instead of lasers. Min Matar uh, use drones, obviously, as everybody else in terms of like more or less tertiary weapon system. And uh, in addition to their projectile system, they also have ships that specialize in rockets. So Min Matar and Kaldari have rockets. Amar have a little bit of rocket ships, but not much. Pretty much the same as with drones. Uh, Galente have very little amount of rocket ships available, but they specialize heavily in drones and blasters. Now, as a first time player, uh, you need to pick the race that will be better for your playstyle originally, because you will get a starter ship, starter skills for that ship, and uh, also some skills for the weapon system of the Empire that you are going to play. Uh, the problem here is that you really, uh, wh when you do PvE encounters, you want to use so-called active tank. So basically you want to take damage and then mitigate it by repairing it, because it is the most efficient uh, way of doing PvE encounters. However, the problem with this kind of active repair is that it takes a lot of energy from your capacitor. This is your mana or energy storage of the ship that you're flying. That is a huge drawback in case of, uh, uh, for example, Amar Empire, because Amar Empire has a lot of ships that specialized in active tanking. Well, actually all of them have, because that's the way to balance the, the game. But Amar lasers, because they are purely energy-based system, they consume a lot of energy per shoot. Hybrid systems use a little bit less. On the other hand, projectile systems don't use energy at all. They can shoot even if you are completely out of capacitor. At the same time, rockets can do that as well. So rockets do not require energy to shoot. Drones do not require energy to shoot. So as a new player with uh, not so good skills in energy management and overall management of your ship, I would suggest that you sh should start with a Min Matar ship because Min Matars have capacity to use these projectile turrets, which are pretty flexible in terms of damage dealing, so you can pick up uh, better NPC types and NPC encounters that you would like to uh, you, uh, visit and uh, engage in. And at the same time, uh, you will have the ability to do a, lo a lot more active repairs without uh, caring much about sustaining the energy of your ship so that you can have some reserve to shoot. Now, second thing is uh, type of shield, uh, t type of tanking. Uh, Min Matar ships are technically shield tanked, most of them. However, uh, that's not a strict rule. They are a little bit more flexible in that aspect as well, so many of them will not have bonuses to either shield of or armor at all, so you will be able to freely choose which one of uh, tanking you want based on the other properties that you encounter and other needs of the purpose for which you would like to design this ship. So, that being said, I would like to say start as Min Matar character. So let's see how EVE Online looks in 2021. Yes, they now suggest that we watch at these ships, a few of them. Okay, not very interesting. Tempest is a battleship-sized vehicle. As an alpha player, you probably want to go for battleships as soon as possible, because otherwise you will be limited in your capacity to play. But if you were an Omega subscriber, then probably that would not be the point. 
unfortunately battleships take a lot of time to train. Now, yeah, there is brief description for each of these. And a little bit of glorification, what cluster weapons and drones and armor tank and ship tank and rockets. Yeah, also Kaldari, in addition to rockets, do have hybrid weapons, the same way as Galente. They use exactly the same weapon system, but it's not primary one, it is more like secondary if not tertiary. In some ships they have ships that specialize but uh, in hybrid, but those are mostly also specialized hulls. Also, for every uh, empire you will get uh, empire-specific pirates. So for Kaldari those are Guristas, for Galente Serpentis, and for Amar Blood Traitors, and then Angle Cartel. In principle this doesn't mean anything really, because you can freely fly across the environment of the game and find whatever pirates you want to shoot. Of course if you would like to roleplay some activity, for example, if you would like to roleplay Minmatar Freedom Fighter, then you will be mostly challenged with Angle Cartel, but even that is not true to a large extent. So yeah, now you have three bloodlines of choice. Back in the day that meant different stats and a little bit different s skill sets, but I think right now it doesn't really matter that much, so this is more of a lore and background type of thing, so you would like to cho choose whatever you want. Inmatar by background are empires that has fought for its freedom from being enslaved by Amar, so they are a little bit rebellious type. Let's see. Innovative thinking, yeah, that's that's something. Now here you can customize a character, you can do some mouse manipulations by selecting parts of the face, or you can do more classic approach by using the panels on the right and on the left, or you can just randomize appearances and see what the random will bring. They are very similar, the game doesn't allow you to change the appearance too much, but to some extent, and using the makeup especially, can receive you can create very interesting combinations let's say again the randomized engine does not really create all possible that you can get here. So, commerce and manufacturing, combat studies and exploration. So yeah, I will probably go with combat studies because this sounds like something that might give us a little bit more training in military skills and guns and flying ships because that is one thing that you really want to train in as early as possible, even if you want to have a rather peaceful career, because even as an industrialist you still need 
to shoot things initially to make some money. I like the frops part in the previous one. sort of your neural interface assistant sort of assistant or Siri of the future and yeah that's interesting so we start in some sc scenario where we are unable to wake up some of our assistant okay yeah she realized that we are awake because it Next, very interesting. She threatened us uh, to kill us and to re establish a new clone with our consciousness. Okay, well, this sounds nothing like real gameplay of Eve actually. It's not really that a ship can be knocked out by some vessel, uh, it's either alive and shooting or dead. Of course you can be jammed, but it doesn't really completely mess us up with your system, you can still fly around. And unless you are actively jammed all the time, the system will automatically recover immediately. Okay, let's try not to die. So yeah, uh, clicking, left clicking and moving mouse around is a way to rotate camera that is one of the basic things so it's up and down left and right and you can use as suggested here double click in this space just double click on the background and the ship will start turning here we have a demonstration site it's green dot usually green dot means some kind of anomaly in the space which you can warp to uh, but in this case, this is a tutorial marker. Our info panel is online. Okay, yeah, great. My objective: welcome to EU meeting. Great, continue. <laughs> Probably as a new player, you might want to be interested in reading all, all of that. Or, but this is still a tutorial. Warp to the signal source. Or warping through this panel is not a, what, how it is typically done. Typically you will find an object in space and right click it. And then you will have this interesting menu. So it will sell, tell you that you can warp to within 0 meters, so exactly on top of the target, plus minus some deviation. Or you can select range at which you want to warp. This is one of the basic skills. You can also set up at which range you want to warp by default, but this is not practically useful. Then you also have this Align tool, which prepares you to warp by setting your direction exactly to the point to which you would have been otherwise warping, but without actually triggering warp engine. Um, prop scanner, yeah, other information is not really useful in this case. So, yeah, warp to location. Let's go. And yeah, interestingly enough, we are going to the other side. <laughs> so this marker was had nothing to do with tutorial. Left before you arrive to a certain 
actually holding Q rings of this interface where you can actually click at any point in space. And by after first left click, you have option to select uh, elevation of your movement. If you use 3D games, you know that this is useful skill if you want to. But yeah, if you if you just click left. If you just click left mode button while holding Q on a, over an object, then it will start so approach to that object. Approach means just go as close as possible, and the ships will often overshoot, try to fly around, so it's not entirely interesting. Now we have Sir Canyon Seeker. Basically, some NPC ship. Uh, these icons here indicate that this is a battle cruiser. The ships have different classes, and the symbol indicates the class the ship belongs to. Okay, so yeah, control left clicking in the overview panel, and this one uh, allows you to select the target. Similar effect you can achieve. Target on the left side, and by right clicking it, and actually, yeah, when you don't have it locked, you will have a lock. But yeah, control left clicking here or here is the most efficient way. Okay, so yeah, it suggests that we should shoot the octane. Well, let's see. Yeah, if you noticed when I here there is another menu. This is the ground menu. It was introduced as an alternative to this right click menu, which is the very original of Eve. And yeah, this left menu you can interface with either space around you or with objects. It is brought up by just clicking and holding left mouse button anywhere on any object and sometimes even in space. So yeah, it allows you to do pretty much the same as most of the other interfaces, so keeping that range or between showing information of an object. Yeah, and now we have a lag because it loads something. Yeah. Just a bit of some stats. Here it also suggests that this target is vulnerable to explosive damage in armor and to electromagnetic and thermal and shield, which is quite typical for shield and armor type chips. But the problem is that this one is probably whole tanked NPC, which has no vulnerabilities. And now we're shooting. So, as you can see, sh shooting brings up here in the center some blocks. And you can see how efficient you are at shooting at your target. It highlights the damage dealt, uh, the type of damage in the, in this case, kinetic and explosive specifically. It doesn't tell you how much of each you deal dealt, but uh, at least it gives you the total and that you have managed to deal damage of specific type. And then the target and the last word indicates how efficient you are at hitting the target. So if it says penetrates or frags, this means that you have uh, scored pretty much the maximum damage. Frag is actually a critical strike. Now, for everything else, like hits or grazes, uh, this means that you have been not very efficient at tracking, so your guns were missing from time to time. Now, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if empires agree, why would should we disagree? Circadian Seekers probably a threat to whole humanity in EVE Online. So, find the station in your overview and dock. Yeah. So yeah, once again, this overview panel is one of the most important interfaces in the game. Uh, you can use some presets that are provided by other players, but I strongly recommend you for the first time and for the first couple of weeks to try and configure your own, because uh, when you learn how to manipulate this interface, it helps a lot.
and then you can use a pre-made one and customize it later. Right clicking and docking, this is one option, then the other option is what I suggest is holding D and left clicking and obviously you can just select it and then in selected item menu you will have this button as well. So there are plenty of ways to not for forget to dock, never forget to dock. the left upper side you can see not comes a mirror lock off timer. This is one of the things and one of the important areas of the game here you have timers. So timers can be yellow, red or also in some in case of some ships you will have capability for jump driving then you will have uh, jump fatigue drive uh, jump fatigue timer. So yellow and red both of them prevent you from locking off the game. So if your connection disconnects or anything happens based on cruise control of your ship, your ship will stay in space and it will continue doing something. Uh, depending on the situation it will either try to emergency warp out from one million kilometers away from the point where you have been in a random direction to hide yourself itself and just wait there and or if you were prevented from warping out, for example if some NPC or player prevents you from doing that, then you will sit there and your ship will in most cases slowly die. Uh, so yeah, keep your connection steady and don't let that happen. Yeah, so now we are presented with Neocom panel. Neocom is essentially just a start menu the game. So here you will have a list of all different interfaces that you can access and there are some shortcuts that have been pre-configured for us but you can also edit them freely so left click and drag it, drop it, fix it, remove shortcut by right clicking, disable button blink if you are annoyed that your account uh, which will blink every time you get some new money uh, into account that it blinks and distracts you. So, yeah. Let's see. What else? Oh yeah, one of the important things is your character sheet. It's not really a button uh, that you can drag, but instead it is a fixed one here and you cannot move it. It's always in the left top corner, right after the start menu of the game. And this is how your character sheet looks like. Here you will have your face, your date of birth, the home system where, you're, where you will respawn in case of death, uh, see security status that indicates whether you are treated as a pirate or not by empires, uh, total net worth that indicates the assets you have, so basically all the ships and assets and property and stations that you own personally, not as a corporation but personally, and the money in your account. Now this is just your bloodline and your current corporation. Oh yeah, sorry, not bloodline. In this case this is probably an indication of an alliance of sort. Now here you have list of categories for skills. So for example under spaceship command if you click it you will have here at the bottom larger list of different skills and if you select all skills you can be a little bit overwhelmed by the sheer amount of that. Uh, the thing is that all skills in Eve Online have five levels so you start by learning uh, is by l taking a skill book injecting it into your brain matrix style and from there you can start training it level by level each level takes slower, takes more time, exponentially, basically. So the first level is trained very fast, even on the like end game skills like Titan. Uh, but every sec every other level takes more and more and more and more. And level five is very difficult to train, even for the fastest trainable skills. It takes about three and a half days to train just level 5. Now from that perspective 
you want to have some planning what you want to train so if you want to really specialize in something then it gets more difficult for you when you do that now here you can also notice that some dots are orange and some dots are gray so orange dots means that you need to have omega stop omega clone status to uh, learn this skill at all and if you have that and uh, you lose the omega status then scales and ships that are linked to that skill will not be available to you so you will not be able to undock them you will not be able to fly them and you will not be able to activate the modules that require this omega status so as a alpha player you first need to think about learning the skills that are here in the gray and now these small dots they mean this means that you are not able to learn this at all because you have either no prerequisites or not a, you don't have a skill book. So skill books are sold by NPCs, most of them, and it's not a big problem. It's sort of a standard uh, way for a game to drain uh, to drain money out of the economy. But at the same time, uh, some skill books are more rare and they require players to do something to achieve them and they are either bought from NPCs from specialized shops or they are dropped from some encounters or they are dropped from exploration there are many play ways to get different skill books but for most of them that you will need you will have uh, to buy them directly from NPCs and also when you uh, mouse over the skill now nowadays you can you see this buy skill button this is uh, not the best way to buy a skill. Usually you can find the skill directly from NPCs at a cheaper price. But if you are in a hurry or in a place where those skill books are not available, if for example you have moved out of high sec space, high security space, then yeah, you can click this button and it will immediately buy and unlock the skill for train. Since we have no money, we are not going to use this luxury either. Uh, yeah, so agency. Agency is a semi-useful screen that gives you some idea of what you can do in your life in EVE Online. Uh, there is nothing uh, very special about it, so there are some mission agents that allow you to take essentially quests to do specific thing. You will have description and then you will fly to a specific point, do something, return to the NPC that gave you this mission and you go on and on and on until you are either tired or basically you have reached some goal that you have set to yourself or i don't know you are getting killed now epic arcs are storyline based missions they have function similarly to mission agents except for that they are more or less unique so you start one and you go through a chain of missions maybe up to 50 missions and they have some storyline and some background and lore linked to them and then you usually get a quite decent reward but at the same time this reward is not really necessary uh, n not really not necessarily pays off for your time then the problem is with these epic arcs if there is something lucrative if you think that some epic arc is good for you to run they are time limited so you will have uh, possibility to complete each epic arc either in three or six months i don't remember the number exactly but uh, after completion of an epic arc you will have to wait real time for several months before you will be able to take another one again otherwise they are very similar to mission agents then agent finder helps you with finding those mission agents very similar thing uh, this screen yeah just checking in case CCP have invented something else now storyline agents are basically a short quick one-time mission that is available every 16th mission of specific level for specific corporations that you have completed using this agent finder and mission agents and they will announce that you have one available by sending you an email you will usually have about seven days to complete it nothing special about that either 
And then career agents is basically what you want to focus on immediately when you start the game because these suggest how you can play the game, they teach you basics of different playstyles like industrial or exploration or military and this is what we were going to do. They also pay quite, int uh, quite good rewards comparing even to the starting missions because you will get skill books, you will get ships that will go, go grow you through and these agents uh, career agents as far as I remember they are one time per character so you cannot really do them again after you have completed them or at least you will not get rewards uh, then second tab is incursions faction warfare stronghold and these are more high level uh, more the, the content for more experienced players, for example, faction warfare is very heavily PvP based. Incursions will require from you quite decently skilled ship, and I don't think it's even possible to run one in Alpha Clone uh, efficiently. So you will probably not be allowed into fleets as an Alpha Clone. And the Abyssal spaces are basically uh, very skill oriented, so you have to have some background knowledge and background skills uh, before you can start doing them otherwise they will just destroy you because they are also time based so you don't have time to think there um, third tab is exploration here you can do uh, combat anomalies very basic stuff you find them you shoot them you get some money from concord for destroying p filthy pirates sometimes they drop some useful things sometimes they will give you random encounters and will send you to another system. Cosmic Signatures is what exploration is mostly about. Here you will find uh, different locations that are hidden from normal overview. A little bit more about, about that later, but they are usually a little bit more rewarding than things that are just available in plain sight. Then Project Discovery is one thing that everybody has very equal footage on. This is something that as a new player I would really recommend you to do. Uh, this is a thing, uh, CCP collaborates with different research institutions uh, when they conduct certain type of, uh, art well, not, I wouldn't say artificial intelligence, but classification problems. So I haven't seen this one yet. Okay, this is professional. Dr. Andrea Kosaritsa from University of Rio. Okay, this university is not real, but the doctor name might be. Anyway, so they are talking about classifying some images based on something. In this case, they will always provide, present you with some kind of tutorial. This topics and subjects for classification, they stay for some time. Okay. Okay, then I'll try to explain to you how this uh, process of measuring works. I really don't know for what purpose because without scientific background I don't think that many people will be able to understand what happens there but on the other hand if you have some engineering scientific background this might be useful information for you to help classifying things better yes Oh yeah, now we have some measurements here that indicate something. And this is, yeah, as far as I understand, this is some measurement sample from blood sample. Each dot represents a cell. Cells of the same type have a group together. And you want to identify boundaries of a cluster. Okay, so this is a basically clustering pr problem so you need to select the range uh, the edges of the cluster start here okay okay so yeah in this
this case we are drawing borders around this cluster by clicking, well not randomly, but defining the edges of this area, which is defined by dots. And yeah, now we have some boundaries and it's apparently the right one, unless we were suggested how to do that. Mm. Now here we have two distant clusters, yeah, the main difference here is this border. So, let's see, okay, apparently we have to here imagine the borders ourselves, well, not imagine, but actually recognize them from the image, yeah, you have to click on the last spot, and then let's draw the second one, somewhere around. Okay, yeah, for those samples that they have manually labeled or where, you, where they have consensus of people, they will have this yellow border, which indicates what is on average or what is opinion of professional scientists or how this look like. Don't really bother much trying to figure out exact shape here, but yeah. You, ideally, you want to have your prediction match to what other people say and what scientists say. Then you will have good accuracy scores and you will have good presentation. The key point here of this whole entertaining process is that you are earning in-game money for this activity. So you do scientific productive work by helping scientists recognize and label clusters within some data set and even if your data is not exactly accurate by the power of communal basically the hive mind of both players you will have some kind of yeah okay so they suggest that this is also some area might be a little bit more annoying but yeah the thing is that for most labels of uh, for most uh, data points and clusters they don't really have an answer if they did there would be no point in doing that so what they do instead is yeah they tr demonstrate you how to clusterize and classify these areas in the original data set for a small set of samples and then once you have yeah once you have something that looks similarly or kind of like what they want to see uh, they say that yeah you now can make predictions Okay, let's make the microphone level a little bit higher. And return to the... So yeah, uh, once again, we, sh we need to mark the cluster. There are some limitations and so on. Okay, again, Trainee data analyst substandard. Essentially, they suggest that all of the data should be classified wherever you have any amount of points. And since cells look very roundish, you should aim for something that is more round rather than just randomly shaped. So yeah, once again, the point of this whole project is that while you're doing a good... You, while you're lending your brain power and ability to recognize shapes to science, you actually earn some resources. 
and these resources at the very beginning of the game are actually quite significant for an even mind player. So for example here you can see that we are earning 26 and a half thousand disc per sample. And yeah, let's wait for or maybe yeah that's more from level up. So every time you classify something you get some experience. Once you get to the next level you get a significant chunk of disc and some amount of some skill books, well as far as I know. May maybe not skill books but skins for your ships, other rare materials which are can also be sold on the market, so you can have some kind of benefit from that as well. And yeah, we still have not earned anything. Let's close it and let's see if if it will update eventually. Because at least it was promising to us that we will get some money. Now, yeah, project discovery is that very useful thing when you start. Then Triglavian space is a new feature. I don't really know how good it is suited for new players. Then and current your surveillance system is really nothing to care about unless you are living in nullsec space, because you will have to deploy this kind of thing and it's slightly improves the, exp uh, the amount of payout you get and changes the nature of payment from pure money to loyalty points of certain corporation but yeah not much not not very interesting thing then asteroid belts and resource harvesting top uh, here you have different industrial activities that will give you well ability to get resources that you can probably potentially sell later. Essentially EVE economy is run by players so you will always uh, use ships and fly ships and use modules and uh, use ammo that is produced by players so everything comes from somewhere so in case you are some kind of a, a player that would like to have everything handcrafted you can build your own ships. Uh, if it is efficient or not depends on how much you spend time how much time you spend to produce those ships in principle you can get a hefty discount maybe 10 to 50 percent depending on the type of product that you produce uh, but you rarely need ships in the amounts that typical industrialist produce oh yeah and now we have received the income you can see that we have bumped our account to 97,000. so yeah as i said project discovery is a very quick bug for a new player. Now, or anomalies, very similar to anomalies with pirates, except for they are designed for players who would like to mine something. So asteroid belts are more like permanent thing, uh, they respawn every day, you go there and mine some asteroids there and get ore to refining station. Ore anomalies spawn from time to time, you have to go to them. Uh, there are also ore signatures which are hidden and which you have to find with uh, exploration. Ice belts similar to ore, uh, except the difference, uh, the, you use different type of guns to mine them and they produce a little bit different type of product uh, which is not used directly in manufacturing of uh, ships but instead it is a fuel for stations and for some ships for jump drives. Planetary industry is a um, well, mini game based production where you will settle up a, set up a colony on a planet and set up the industry chain there and then produce stuff and produce stuff and export it from the planet and be happy about that and yeah sell it on the market or build your own ship out of that fleet activities this is a pvp stuff well i really don't know if it is a good idea to join any of these fleets just because they are here uh, maybe 
resource harvesting fleets, but I would not suggest that you should do that. We will get to that later, maybe. Yeah. Now there is tutorial. Okay, that's uh, where we are actually guided by the whole tutorial. So they suggest that we start investigating this whole the attack of circadian ships and seekers. So, okay, now we are given some indication what to, what station services are. Um, yeah, whenever you are docked, so this is a hangar, and you will have your ship shown, your active ship shown in the center of the screen. You can spin it. If you spin it hard enough, you can even start getting counter. Or you can start getting headache, depending on well, whether you like it or not. Then, in station services, the biggest and most important button is undock. It's lit in yellow because it's a dangerous action. Whenever you undock, you might get killed. Then, from there, you have an option to board a corvette. Corvette is essentially a starter ship. You can board your specific racial corvette, which is in this case what we are flying, uh, pretty much at any station. It will show you this button whenever you are not on one. Then you have a lot of different services. The amount of services and type of services depends on the station, depends on whether it is a player-owned station or NPC, and whether NPCs provide certain facilities for you. Uh, for example, in this case, loyalty point store is something that you use when you run missions for some corporation then you are able to buy some stuff from them directly uh, usually stuff that is not available other ways uh, using other ways now uh, ship insurance is somewhat important thing uh, because it allows you to mitigate risk of losing your ship uh, by paying upfront 30 percent or actually up to 30 percent of the cost of that ship how and if you get destroyed within three months of real time, uh, then you will be paid f full price of the ship back. So you pay 30%, but you get 100% uh, in return if you die. Uh, the problem is that it does not f uh, count any modules, so you will get always less. And then there is also default insurance. So even if you don't pay anything, you will still get paid 40% of the cost of your hull. Uh, again, the cost of the hull is also a relative term because uh, it the estimate and the price will vary. And for example, ships that are more specialized, the so-called tier two ships, they have very low valuation of uh, their hulls by insurance company, whereas their actual cost on the market might be extremely high. Now, second thing, factional warfare. Uh, this is a PvP activity, mostly. You sign up with one of the empires and fly. Industry. This is where you go if you want to manufacture something. You will have list of available blueprints and list of facilities, uh, either research or manufacturing, depending on where you are. You can have different filters based on what you want to achieve. There are different industrial actions. I'm not going into that at the moment. Then the window that you are going to be visiting a lot. This is the window of fitting your ship. Here you will have uh, your guns. Your bas Basically the ship is fit with four types of modules. In this case, you don't see these type of modules, which are called rigs which are essentially modifications to the hull of your ship and like core properties of it. Then you have high F energy slots, medium energy slots and low energy slots. These three categories have different types of modules that fit into them. Uh, high energy slots are typically slots for guns, even if those guns don't use energy at all. Uh, medium energy slots are used for propulsion modules like afterburners or microwave drive and uh, very actively they are used for shield tanking. 
then low energy slots are used for different passive bonuses like in increasing damage of your weapon systems or uh, changing the properties of your reactor core and they are also used by armor tanking modules. Uh, these are not exclusive, so some armor tanking modules will go to mid slots, some of shield tanking modules will go to load slots, but uh, those, the core uh, allocation is more or less like that. Uh, then you will also have different modules that have I active and passive variation. So for example, a module that improves tracking of your uh, ship, that allows you to target things better, it goes an inactive version of it goes into the medium slot and you can select whether you want to either shoot further or uh, track smaller targets that are closer to you. Or it will have a passive version that will go into low slot that will give you both and a little bit more than average value but you will not be able to select either of two. On the other hand it will not use energy for that. So. There are many trade-offs that you are about to make in this game if you are going to continue. Also here you will have a button that opens your cargo hold. This is the storage of your ship. You can see that this one has 120 cubic meters of space available. And then drone bay that allows you to store drones that you will eventually launch in space. And then from there, just about it, you will not really get much extra information from me now I guess yeah another thing important thing here two more so first one the right panel here you can open different properties of your ship I will not go directly into details about each of them but briefly so the up above you have capacitor this is the amount of energy you have like the total amount of energy which people really usually don't care about in terms of absolute numbers uh, the amount of uh, the rate of recharge or how quickly this whole amount will be recharged if left um, from zero. Uh, then you have delta, which gives how fast is peak energy rec recharge rate versus the amount of energy that your s guns and other systems will use potentially if all activated. And then this up above this green stable mark will either be green stable or it will have red count uh, red amount of time that is estimate how much your capacitor will last in combat assuming that you would activate all of your uh, modules and start from a full capacitor this is an important characteristic for pve because most in many cases you really want it to be either stable or some large number about 20 30 minutes so that you don't really care uh, so that you are sure that you can use all of your uh, guns and propulsion modules at the same time and not care, uh, not, not think about energy, because energy management uh, to that precision is a little bit challenging and you don't really want it in PvE, at least in the relaxed versions of that. And second part is offense. This indicates how much uh, the game estimates you will do damage with your damage uh, gun systems and here are two important properties uh, damage per second and then alpha strike alpha strike means how much you do per shoot the game will then iterate this amount every time and yeah this means you are shooting uh, 7 hp but uh, you are obviously not doing it every second but you do it like 1.60 second the six uh, one second and 600 milliseconds or so that depends on the rate of fire of your gun, obviously. Now, defense tab here, this one indicates your health points. Those are called effective health points for a reason, because you have the real health point, the 172 in structure, 172 in armor, and then 183 in shield. And then you have resistances. This effective health points uses uh, average uh, damage profiles. So you will have estimate how much it will take of actual damage dealt by a gun that shoots every type of damage equally uh, to kill you. This is not much, 766 is a very small number, but we are flying a 
ship that is effectively free and has no modules in it pretty much at the moment, so that's not surprising that we have no resources and no survivability at all. And targeting shows you from which distance you can lock targets. It is a limited range, you will not be able to lock targets that are too far away. Then you will have points of strength of your sensor system, you don't really need to care about it at this point. Uh, signature radius is how big is your ship, surprisingly. In the targeting um, tab you will be told how much is the size of your ship. Uh, well, the logic. Now scan resolution is a measurement that tells uh, the game how fast you can lock. So the larger this number, the faster you can lock targets. Uh, the equation is basically scan resolution divided by the size of the target and some constant. So in this case uh, you will have, well, quite a good one. Uh, everything above 200, well, uh, the thing with scan resolution is that it drops uh, the the larger is your ship. So for small ships, frigate size and corvettes, you will typically have some numbers in, of several hundreds and you will instantly have a lock on the target. For larger ships, you might have numbers that are closer to 20, 40 millimeters and then the lock time might take several seconds depending on the size of the target and especially if it's this, if you are trying to target a frigate from battleship then it might take uh, over a minute. Then yeah, this limits your ability to quickly switch targets. Especially this is uh, critical because here is the second metric which is important, it is maximum amount of lock targets, so you can only track so much and so many ships at the same time. You can only say select three at this time and shoot one and once it's dead you will have to start locking another one and you have to finish locking that third ship before uh, you will be able to shoot it at it, so you will have only two ships in the buffer. This is not a very critical parameter for frigate size, but once you get to cruisers and especially to battleships, then you will start noticing that there is something happening here and you will want to have this number also quite large. Then a navigation tab. Here this one indicates your maximum linear speed when you are not using warp drive. Basically, how far you can, how fast you can go. Then this metric indicates the mass of your ship. It's not really important for you at this stage of the game because uh, this only is used specifically with uh, some properties of the wormholes, some properties of jump drives and uh, some properties of the uh, propulsion modules and armor tanking modules. So this is just a very, very narrowly used characteristic, you don't really think about it that much in the game. Then this is the maximum speed of your warp drive. Uh, this is when you go and engage your warp drive and you will accelerate up to this point and then you will cruise at this speed. Three, meters, uh, 3 astronomical units per second is quite slow for a frigate, usually you will have something around 4 and a half and 6, depending on the type of the ship. This is closer to what cruisers have usually. Again, the larger the ship, the slower it is, so the navigation within the system is slowing down, is slowed down for large ship as well. Uh, the freighters and other large-scale haulers might have this number at the ranges below 0 and 0.5 astronomical units per second and it takes ages to cross from one end to star system to another so going from one gate to another gate takes a lot of time. This inertia modifier allow, allows you to know how easily your ship uh, turns and how fa quickly it is able to accelerate, deaccelerate and go uh, and change direction. However, this number you rarely used uh, on its own. Instead, people use this align time. This align time is an indicator of how fast it takes your ship to go from zero to entering warp, which happens typically at 75% of your maximum velocity. So this number at the bottom, 623 seconds, it's quite garbage for the frigate, but uh, the point is that you want to have this as small as possible if you want an agile ship. For a larger ship like Battleship this number can be 30 seconds easily and for cruisers it's typically like 10 to 
to 12 seconds again depending on the size uh, on the s purpose of that cruiser maybe if it is a more agile ship then it might try to minimize this number and uh, operate quickly uh, the thing the relation between this speed and agility is very challenging to apply because for example you might have a frigate that will have very high speed like four kilometers per second but then if it has uh, even like two second agility it will not be even able to uh, achieve its maximum speed if it tries to orbit target at a low uh, range so if it will, you will try to orbit something at 500 meters per second then unfortunately it will not achieve its maximum speed because of the low agility now the final one is drones this is basically the information how much bandwidth uh, you have this is like a control command line to your drones uh, every type of drone uses specific amounts so light drones use five per drone uh, medium drones use 10 per drone and heavy drones the, and center drones uh, uh, the largest ones use 25 per drone so in this case you can see that in theory the ship can maximum at maximum use one light drone and not more it doesn't really matter how many skills how what you train it will be just that and you can see the drone control range this is the range at which your target can be before you will be able to issue a command to the drone to attack the target basically in addition to the targeting range you will also need to check that your drones are able to fly that far in some cases you might circumvent uh, the targeting range so you m might have a drone ship that will have very low targeting range but high drone control range and at the same time drones will automatically shoot targets you will not be able to command them but they will do that for you and yeah you can open drone bay again Finally, here at the bottom, you can see how much it will cost to rebuy the ship. This is also kind of junk because Reaper is free, and this civilian afterburner is also free for you. But this is a market estimate, so if you will try to sell the ship at the market, you will get this much probably. But yeah, let's continue. Now, regional market. This is a reporting screen. This allows you to buy stuff. Um, Unfortunately, we are now located somewhere where we are very far away from real trading stations, so we are not going to look into that at the moment. Uh, reprocessing plant is necessary for mining. Uh, you will use it a lot if you want to get ores and produce minerals. Then repair shop is a screen where you can use either NPC station where you will pay money or you can dock at a player citadel where you will probably for free get uh, repairs to armor and hull of your ship both of the repairs can be done by specialized modules if you just plug them into your ship and undock and activate them but it takes time this one helps you do that immediately it also repairs the modules which is more important uh, after you overheat them but that's again a little bit more advanced topic um, repair shop now clone bay is a place where you can change your home base effectively as uh, a place where you want to revive it also allows you to manage uh, your jump clones jump clones are effectively like alternative uh, places where you store your location and you can switch between them every uh, well about one day you will have a little bit shorter cooldowns once you train some skills but about one day and finally you can go and try to customize your appearance change how your avatar looks like similar to what you have in the very original screen okay let's see Yeah, wise warning. Once you undock, you might be killed. Not immediately, because, for example, here you can see on the left corner location change timer, and even after that, for some time, you will have immunity from being targeted by other players. 
so if you immediately press control space and trigger this stopping only by this combination uh, you will be able to slow down and potentially redock back into the station mode in this case we have already too far away to be able to do that okay or the location indicated to Concord. I just want to, to us to use this menu. You can also do it here. So uh, here you will have list of quests by right clicking and you can do warp to location from this menu. I want to remove is camera shake. This is one of the most annoying features which is for some reason enabled by default. Okay. So yeah, we have found circadian seeker, it's here, yeah. And they want us to orbit it at one kilometer. So let's press W as they suggest and left click it. If you press this button, tactical overlay, you will start seeing uh, these grid and ranges and most importantly, you will be able to see the orbit trajectory of your ship that it will achieve once it gets to the target. Or at least it will try to achieve once it gets to the target. At the same time, you will also see a few interesting arrows here this one indicates your speed this and this one indicates the speed of your target relative to you uh, these are both very important data points which you want to keep track of when you are shooting with guns and miss for some reason this is typically because the range uh, the, the relative speed is too high or the distance is too close you can check that by adding angular velocity col column this number angular velocity in radians per second gives you basically information how fast your target moves around you at this given distance now, yeah, what they want, lock, lock it, right click and lock targets, yeah, okay. And now they want us to probably shoot it, yeah. You can left click the modules here, this is a gun, and you can press F1, all modules will have these kind of designation so the first row is f1 to f8 and then alt f1 to alt f8 and then control f1 to control f8 you can see these hints while dragging any of the modules there are multiple slots and you can mostly freely allocate them uh, the first inis the initial allocation will be done by the module type but they don't have to stay in the slots you can customize this freely this doesn't affect the layout in the fitting so you cannot move one slot to another just mm, to, s to fit something that you cannot fit otherwise yeah and also when you mouse over any of the modules you get a hint with some information technical details about the modules especially useful information about uh, guns which indicate how far they shoot so in this case we're using civilian gatlin auto cannon this is a l short range minotaur weapon uh, and you can see when we mouse over there is now red circle that appears in the overlay uh, the inner circle indicates the optimal range of the weapon this is the range at which it will deal maximum damage from the perspective of distance to the target and then the second circle the outer one is the range at, wi at which your weapon will deal uh, half of the damage is fall, fall off range so beyond that 
it will deal less than half of the damage that is prescribed to it because just because of the distance because of the projectile will slow down apparently in space uh, which is a little bit of physics now let's shoot when the gun is shooting you can see this white line going around it this is uh, information about the cycle so once it reaches the full cycle it shoots or actually it shoots immediately and then this white cycle is basically reload of um, between shots it is not a reload for the ammo however so when you will have ammo loaded in this case this is a little bit cheaty civilian gatlin auto cannon which does not actually use ammo although it should uh, you will have indication of how much ammo you have left and once you are out of ammo that is loaded you will have some delay to reload the ammo right click and open cargo because we are far away yeah we are now having this message that says our ship automatically approaching the target It will happen automatically. Uh, meanwhile, while we are doing that, we can activate the second module that is available, that is civilian afterburner. It increases our speed. Uh, the drawback of using this module is that it actually decreases our agility. This uh, align time gets worse. So you really don't want to use uh, this one mm, without thinking where, at which distance you are from target. So at some point it is better to just circle target without afterburner on the other hand for most cases you will want to do that um close inventory to proceed this is the weirdest trigger i've ever seen <sighs> let's report back to concord okay claim rewards yay this is less than half of a single discovery sample Speaking about good rewards for training. Check your wallet, confirm Concord has compensated you for your hard work. Yeah, we were compensated. We can use wallet. I mean, believe those seekers may have been transmitting data to a specific location. Warp. Warp immediately. The Eve universe is in danger. Don't wait. Interestingly enough, when you start playing, probably the first thing that you want to do is actually start training some skills. Because while you are doing this uh, whole entertaining tutorial, you can already start getting start working on second level of Minimatar Frigate or some other uh, useful skill. You can also have up to 24 hours of skills in the queue. Uh, and 24 hours means that they should have within the next 24 hours so in this case you can see that i have plugged in a skill that trains for three days and 10 seconds so now we have sentry towers okay i've been transmitting sensitive data to sentry towers they are armed need to take them offline here is too far away. Um, the key to accuracy is not only to fly into weapons optimal range, but this is one of the primary things that you must think about if your target is stationary, of course. Now, you have to get closer to it because it's very far away, and you can see. So there is relative spot projection and it is outside of this even 5 km radius. Now we can start shooting. And once we get closer we can actually start orbiting it as well. Be 
careful when you're small, flying small ships, when your ship speed goes down, you become very easy target. That is one of the issues with, uh, with having agile ships, that whenever they stop, either willingly or because they were stopped by an active module, they become a very fragile and very quickly dying target. Orbit lock and fire. Well, it sounds like a Galente gameplay actually. But yeah, a gameplay that you will see a lot for small ships. Okay, that's it. We are worthy capsulator now. Um, okay, now now they suggested to do something with our character sheet. I hope now they, yeah, now they say that we should learn something. Great. Gunnery skills. Surgical strike. Hmm. Well. Actually, it looks like we have already quite decent skills. Level 2 is much better than 0, so we are not going to get any immediate improvement if we start training any of these three, which are like core skills for shooting. And then Surgical Strike, yeah, okay, 1 hour and 7 minutes. This one just improves the damage flat, 3% bonus to damage. Nothing really special, but it is useful. Uh, Arguably, Minmatar Frigate skill is, well, probably the same in terms of efficiency per training speed, because it gives you bonuses to your ship, and these bonuses to your ship are typically also giving you bonus to the damage of the guns of certain type. In case of this one, for example, show info. Uh, yeah, here you can see roll bonus. Okay, yeah, this one is not dependent on any skill level. You will just have max velocity, projectile, true damage, flat, target painter, flat, shield booster, flat. Okay. Again. Um. Destroy jammer, restore communication. Okay. Let's warp there. Warp times can vary significantly, and your maximum warp speed is not really mm, just a single factor. The problem is also that it affects the speed of accelerating and deaccelerating. So, on a ship that has very low warp speed, you will also have it will also take ages to accelerate to that speed. Now, they want us again to warp with this. Poor thing fails to hit us. Probably has some really, really poor guns. Uh, one such interesting thing that you can do in the interface on the upper right side from the targeted icon, there is this cross, and if you click and drag it, you can actually move it to any place on the screen. So your targets will appear somewhere in a, in a somewhat more useful place, more convenient for you, hopefully.
sorry, for a brief change in the aspect ratio. Okay, so hostile inbound. Oh yeah, one more thing that you probably want to do that uh, immediately when you start playing the game. In general settings, there is okay auto target back is now set by default to zero targets auto target back is a feature that allows you to select any ship automatically that targets you so you don't have to control click it the problem is that uh, this enables players uh, to trick you into combat situations where you don't want to be for example if somebody some other players lock you you will have this yellow blinking icon around them and your ship will automatically target them back and if you at the same time are shooting some NPCs and you don't pay attention to what target you are shooting at then you might accidentally start uh, shooting at a player which will likely lead to your destruction by Concord immediately and yeah, that's local target you can see the circle around that indicates how much time it takes to lock. In this case it was about 3 seconds. This ship has icon of a frigate, but it's still quite easy to hit, despite that. It hits us a little bit. But as you can see, the regeneration of the shield is actually a quite useful thing. Okay, now we have mm, chat. So the whole thing was to enable chat. Well, so yeah, there are local channel that is available within the same system and then corporation that is your corporation. In this case, this is a default one where all uh, novi novice, novice players of the same origin appear and then rookie help is useful chat where you want to ask questions some people there will definitely try to help you um, open tutorial claim rewards okay I reached in space yeah now we are told how to use afterburner Seeker is attempting to flee. Okay. Mm Let's go to it as fast as possible. Yeah, don't forget to activate afterburner. It increases your maximum speed, in this case to 605 meters per second. And yeah, if a target tries to flee, usually approaching is it is the best decision. Yeah, from 5 kilometers we can start shooting, we will start getting some hits now. Okay, yeah. So 5 kilometers is the range of so-called double falloff actually. So at that point you already have like 1% chance of hitting a target. So it's not really that good as I imagined. Okay.
Okay. Looking up on arrival. Uh, I am not pleasantly su surprised that I survived tutorial, honestly. Okay, now we get our first real guns. So we get a set of two Gatling auto cannons and some ammo to use with it. Rewards, 10,000 disc, activate, okay, fitting, great. Let's have a look. First of all, yeah, yeah, of course. We need to remove the module by clicking this one. You can also, whenever you have the gun fitted, you can also have module just drag and dropped out of the slot into another slot or into the cargo. It doesn't matter. So yeah, now going from here, you want to open the cargo. And as you can see, I have used this always show full tree tick box because that allows you to see the whole all all assets that you have within the station. Uh, this gives you access to your item hunger of the station. It gives you access to the list of ships, and individual ships will have also their own hangers. You will have drone bay. You will have the hunger of your current the active ship. And then you have Plex Vault, which is basically special storage for your uh, premium currency. Now, in item hanger, we now have these two 125mm Gatling guns. Uh, you can drag them, as suggested here, but also you can right-click and fit to active ship this way. And once you do that, what you want to do is press this group all weapons button because this allows you to virtually convert them into a single gun that you can activate in one button click you don't really have to press individual ones and from here you just drag and drop the ammo and don't forget to put the rest of the ammo into your cargo hold because this will help a lot with the actual fight once you run out of the first load. In this case you are not likely to, do, to have this problem quickly, but in case never fly without reserve of ammo if your guns especially require that. For example for lasers you don't strictly ha need to have reserve as long as you use uh, uh, non-factional or non tech 2 lenses the standard lenses for lasers last forever, literally. They are not destroyable, even though they are considered ammo, but so was it hard. Mm, no. Open tutorial. Okay. That's it. That's the whole mission. Battle in the ruins. Test your skills with combat mission. Mm, that's a soldier reward for a starter. 100,000 disc. With that you can buy nothing still, but that at least sounds significant, considering that prices for free get start around 1 million nowadays, I think. Mm. I will probably hide the chat so that we don't publish other people's private data. Let's initially to warp sequence. Okay. Uh, this spam in the overview that you can see now are so-called mobile depots, basically uh, container modules that you can deploy in space and use them as your mobile base. A very useful tool, but uh, in this case it is abused by somebody to just spam around the contents. The problem is that you cannot really easily destroy it. It will last for at least one day if deployed. Uh, so you will have to put some effort into destruction of that by showing up at least two times which takes some 
people and especially if you deploy a lot of them at the same time people will just get annoyed doing clean up now sentry towers okay trial by fire Actually, orbiting at 500 meters for these guns makes no sense uh, because optimal range is, well, in this case, is already 1400 because of the ammo. And yeah, we don't really need to get closer than that when you are not trying to abate some damage because otherwise you will be. Uh, even, even though this is a stationary target, because of the way f relative relativity works, you will end up in a situation where you create movement that prevents you from hitting the target, so you don't want to do that. Another hint, uh, don't really ever, when you are flying a small ship, just select an orbit target if you are far away from it. Instead, you want to double-click in a space and slightly off course to that target and only then you want to do orbiting when you get closer because otherwise you will kill your speed relative to the target again and you will let it hit you. In this case I think that the sentry is uh, rocket based so you don't really it doesn't really care at which speed you or actually at which direction you approach that. So yeah you can see rockets hitting so it's not a gun based sentry. If it was a gun based sentry, then we could have had some significant hits again if it was not a tutorial either. Oh, yeah, locking and shooting. Once you have started locking any target, you can already press the gun and it will start blinking and it will wait for the next object to lock. So it will immediately start shooting at the target. Okay, more seekers, more seekers from this direction. So f how to rotate? Let's first double click into this bottom direction to make sure that we don't immediately again kill our direction, uh, our velocity and then turn again a little bit to the targets. And because this is a group of three ships, it would be very challenging to actually keep our velocity relative to all of them high at the same time. So I will set our orbit distance to 2500 because that will help a little bit with the fact that this is a larger group and this group is distributed. You can see this orbit is a little bit suboptimal. At some point we will have head mostly straight towards this one, but yeah. And using WS shortcut definitely helps to speed up orbiting another one. You can set default orbit range by right-clicking the orbit and you can here type any number of meters, so even the numbers that are not available. In this case I will set it to optimal of our current setup. Uh, these numbers are preserved per ship, or actually per hull type I think, but the point is that um, once you switch to another one uh, you will have you will be able to have presets for different types of ships. Okay, here are more dangerous ships. These are destroyers. Destroyers are famous for being able to actually shoot well at frigate-sized ships and doing a lot of damage to them at the same time. But they are already one step slower and one step less agile, so they are even easier to hit for us. And the only problem is that they still have guns that are good at shooting small ships. Now this one. Of course, in tutorial it's really difficult to expect that there will be something challenging in terms of um, risks to actually die. Uh, even though we have literally nothing in terms of tanking, the ships now do so little damage to us that, well, I don't know what kind of ship you need to fly to be destroyed by this. Most pleased, yes.
plane. And yeah, now we need to go and visit career agent base, which is located three jumps away. So this is interface that highlights our route. If you open star map of EVE Online, you will find that there are, there are plenty of systems actually very big amounts like every single dot on this map is a star system and that's not all of them there are also systems that are not located in so-called uh, well known known space case space so this is our current small pocket of the universe which is located in metropolis region as far as i understand you can highlight over metropolis and you see all the lines connecting stargates blinking for that region uh, regions are typically controlled by one of the empires so the citadel is controlled by the state uh, the caldari state the forge as well and then you have galentes in place in essence verge vendor every shore and then you have uh, amar empire kador domain tashmurkon corazor and other systems and then Minamatars have Heimatar, Metropolis, and not Pochvin, <laughs> unfortunately, Molden Heath. And then there are plenty of other regions that are actually, not all of them are pirate regions, some of them are. For example, Syndicate is a pirate region, which is a null sec region controlled by pirates. Then Cloud Ring is, well, not Cloud Ring, I think Outer Ring. Yeah, this one is controlled by an uh, industrial NPC corporation, which is not well, not pirates. They are part of Galente Federation, as far as I remember. And yeah, and then most of this stuff on the right and here, you will have uh, they. These are systems that are controlled by players, actually. So you you will have find player based empires there if we if you fly that way and yeah okay now they suggest that we find the stargate and go there okay pay tour you can again right click it and warp to or jump uh, never jump when you are in fleet of players but since you are going there alone and since you know that this is a high security space you can see the security rating of the system indicated as a number from 0 to 1 um, everything which is 0 0.5 and above is considered high security space in such space Concord police will punish whomever will try to attack you so if you are lucky then and if the person attacking you is not very prepared then they might even destroy them before they kill you but in the worst possible case, they will at least destroy the offender. It will not save your ship, but some sweet revenge. Now, once you are here, if you have not pressed jump, then you will have some kind of... You will have the ability to jump directly from, the, from within the location of the gate. I will show you in a moment how to do that. The game suggests that we should jump, 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 but really you don't have to. You can also enable autopilot here. Once you do that, the ship will automatically warp to the gate at 10 km range, which is a small penalty for using autopilot, but it will automatically then approach the gate and automatically jump from zero range. And at the same time, it will in the next system just activate again warp drive and warp to the next gate and if you have st a station selected at the end then it will fly to the destination station and dock up which is a good feature some super deals 
I am specifically interested in playing as an alpha and even without any referral program bonuses, so that is the most useful video for people who start up, so I will not really donate anything in this case. Um, okay, and let's warp there again. You can see the planets hanging around, hanging in the space. In the early days of EVE there was probably some plan to make the orbits of planets actually uh, moving over time, but I think it never have been implemented and in reality, although every planet has some trajectory, some orbit, it is fixed in place despite that. So it's not really in that aspect as high tech as a little dangerous, but there is age difference between these games, so yeah. Yeah, once you are at the gate, you can use this jump button. You can also notice this kind of green line. This green line indicates that this ship belongs to the same corporation as you. So this is another player that is still in the novice starter corporation of your origin, and they fly some treasure, or in this case this is the burst. Once you stay in this corporation, while you stay there, you will have a lot of different players still visible in this uh, green highlight, and after uh, you leave it, after you find found your own corporation or switch to another group that is run completely by players, uh, then you will have other groups of people which is a little bit more meaningful, because um, currently these green names don't really mean anything. They, these players will not help you, they are not your friends, they are not your allies, they don't care about you, and you probably should not care about them much either. These NPC corporations are just a default place for you to be in, because um, from perspective of lore, every capsuleer should have a corporation that uh, basically handles the cloning process for them. Yeah, and now we are docking up to the Republic Military School, which is the place where all of our uh, career agents are. I guess at this point I will wrap up today's stream because uh, going through any of these careers agents will take easily at least two three hours and explaining all of that in the process. I hope this was useful information to you people who would like to start EVE Online and let's see you in another one.